Building a race car is an art form like no other. It has a clearly defined purpose, to win. The skills, passion and artistry of many craftsmen are combined to create an object of great beauty. But if it doesn't win, you may as well hang it in an art gallery. Many have tried to master this elusive art. Few have succeeded. Because winning takes something more. In the battle that was the Cobra Ferrari Wars, that something was personal. The battle between the two of them was a personal thing between Shelby and Anzo Ferrari. It went way back into Shelby's early racing career, and it was very personal. Ferrari was a little dictator. The thing that fueled me to challenge Ferrari was the fact that he was a kingpin. He was on top of the heap. This is the story of two cars, two men, and one race. It is the story of one man's dream to build a car that would take on the imperious aristocracy of European racing and win. That car was the Shelby Cobra. The man who named it, Carol Shelby. I got my driver's license at 14 years old. The first thing I'd do is take my dad's 34 Dodge out and get caught by the cop for driving 85 miles an hour. Got grounded from that for a while. I wasn't a very good student because I was always dreaming of my cars. Went and tried several businesses, but I really wasn't happy. I wanted to do something with automobiles. Shelby pursued a career as a racing driver. He had a raw talent for driving and became a favorite gun for hire, mainly at the wheel of cars owned by local wealthy racing enthusiasts, hungry for the kudos of a race-winning car. In three short years, Shelby rose to the top of the US scene. He then set his sights on conquering the exotic world of European racing. Shelby's stateside success had not gone unnoticed across the pond, but it was the British Aston Martin team that were first to approach him, not only for his race-winning ability, but because they thought that having an American driver might generate sales for them in the States. What's more, this American driver arrived complete with gimmick. The first time Carl Shelby arrived in England, he had a sort of overall on. When he was a younger man, he had a chicken farm. And he was uh, on the chicken farm one day when he got a telephone call from a, uh, a racing friend. And he, he literally left his chicken farm with his chicken overall on and went down and, and, and tried this car out and got the drive. Somebody said, my word, that's a sort of unusual bit of kit to wear. Carl, you ought to stick with this and uh, people won't forget you. And of course that was the case. He came to Europe wearing his chicken overalls. In Europe, motor racing had been shaped by the wealthy aristocracy. They'd formed automobile clubs to pursue their love of road racing. Shelby found himself on the circuits of Monaco, Monza and Spa. This was the home of Maserati, Jaguar and Ferrari. The paddock was populated by men like Sir David Brown, Fangio and Moss. These gentlemen racers typified the wealthy amateur pursuing their passion for speed. He had joined the European elite. As a race driver, he was very, very good. Uh, I don't think we necessarily appreciate him quite so much in England because we didn't know his history in America. But in America, he was champion and he won race after race after race. 
Shelby was a natural at the wheel. Kind in the machinery and with a cool head, he battled around Europe for Aston Martin with much success. But the highest achievement in European racing remained unconquered. In 1959, Shelby and Aston Martin set their sights on the cruelest, toughest race in the world, Le Mans. This is Le Mans, the most prestigious circuit in international road racing. For a decade, the red avalanche of Ferrari has dominated the field. American cars, from Cadillac to... From its beginnings at the turn of the century, a win at Le Mans was considered the highest accolade a car and driver could achieve. It was a punishing race, 24 hours around the clock, an indiscriminate destroyer of man and machine. Merely finishing was an achievement in itself. 24 hours, different weathers, constantly passing cars, small cars. It is the race. It's always talked of as the race, if anybody talks in terms of, of sports cars. Le Mans, at that time, wasn't a race. That was an endurance contest. But it was the contest that everyone wanted to win. To do it would mean beating the pinnacle of race car engineering, the vehicles of Enzo Ferrari. A man who had won here so many times, he may as well have owned the track. Shelby and his teammate Roy Salvadori were partnered for the event. We thought our chances were reasonably zero prior to the, uh, uh, the race. In practice, we, only, we didn't treat it very seriously. We drove uh, uh, in one practice session. There are three there. He said that we shouldn't practice more than one day because we'd wear the car out. And he said, let's stop at Le Chart and I'll teach you a good card game, Salvadori. He said, it's called Gin Rummy. <laughs> and uh, I knew a bit about Gin Rummy. And I did, I think, better out of that than, you know, the take we had from Aston Martins over the race. At 4 p.m. the following day, the drivers lined up for the start. Shelby and Aston Martin versus the might of Modena, Ferrari. Shelby paced himself and the car, driving night and day through the grueling marathon. Lap after lap, the race wore on. And as much larger teams fell by the wayside, at 4 p.m. the following day, the crown of European racing was waiting for him. Unbelievably, Shelby had mastered the most prestigious of all races and beaten Ferrari on his first attempt. To Aston Martin, Great Britain and the United States, he was an all-conquering hero. The accolades poured in, he was voted Sports Illustrated Driver of the Year. His ascent had been remarkable and now he would reap the rewards. But Shelby harbored a secret. I knew that I had hereditary problems, and my father had died at, in 1943 at 46 years old uh, with it, so uh, I figured there was nothing that could be done. I didn't know there was anything wrong with him at all. I mean, he'd always been as fit as a flea, you know, but you never really know what's around the corner, do you? I had to take probably six or eight uh, pills during a 24-hour race at Le Mans, and then I had to take them all the next year. I was actually driving a Lotus at that time with Jimmy Clark, and, uh, and we finished just behind him. We crossed the line just behind him, and uh, that was the first time I met Carol. I had no idea at that time that he was actually suffering from a heart condition already, and I think he kept it very quiet. Nobody knew about it. Shelby had angina. The world was astonished when at the peak of his career, he announced his retirement. Doctors had finally forced him to face the inevitable. The driver's seat of a race car was no place to be with a heart condition. Having reached the top of the profession he loved, Shelby returned to California and with his girlfriend, Joan Cole, tried to figure out how he would earn a living. I think that coming from his 
background, which was very poor, um, and having experienced the world as a race driver, he was concerned about what he was going to do in his uh, race car retirement. The racing scene in California in the 60s was very different to the one he just conquered in Europe. This was a rough, tough world where duels were fought out on simple tracks in unsophisticated cars. Shelby stuck as close as he could to this rapidly developing scene, albeit a long way from the driving seat. Most people who enjoy motor racing find the more they learn about it, the more they study good driving techniques, the more interesting the sport is to them. Shelby had... Um, the 11 Western States distributorship for Goodyear Racing Tires and had um, also started a school of high performance driving uh, at Riverside Raceway in Riverside, California. So we took, um, I hate using the word office because it was, it was kind of the size of a closet uh, for the two of us. Shelby, the Le Mans winner and international racing hero, was now selling tires and teaching wannabe racing drivers. But the love of competitive racing that had driven him to the top would not leave him. He knew he had to get back to the racetracks of the world. If not in the driving seat, then he'd find another way. Well, I started trying to build my own car in 1951 with my friend Ed Wilkins, who owned the MGTC. We tried to build a Chrysler Special and, uh, in my garage at home, and we made so much noise that my wife made me quit. But I always had in the back of my mind I wanted to build my own car. Carol um, was a man who had an idea. I don't think at the time that I met him you really could qualify it as a dream. It was an idea. building a race car to the major manufacturers in the U.S. He had been to Ed Cole, who at that time headed up uh, the Chevrolet division for General Motors in Detroit. And I told him I wanted to build my own sport car. They said, we don't need another sport car. We have a Corvette. For the last five years, the Corvette had been the car to be seen in. Its Art Deco styling and V8 performance captured the hearts and wallets of America's affluent youth, whilst arch rival Ford could only sit by and watch. At about that time, in 1960, right at that start of that, I was made head of the Ford division by Henry Ford and Robert McNamara. And uh, Chevrolet was knocking the hell out of us, both in the market on cars and, and on the track. We weren't doing very well. I thought I had to do something quick to change the image because we weren't selling to anybody, let alone young people. They just didn't, they didn't go for the stuff we had to offer. Ford, Chevrolet's arch rival, were selling family values and the market wasn't buying. Shelby's timing couldn't have been better. First time I saw him, he comes in, always a good looking, 
terrific Texan tall guy with wearing a big 20 gallon hat or something <laughs> and boots and always had a great looking girl on his arm. That I remember about. The basis of Shelby's idea to put a very large engine in a lightweight body came at exactly the right time for Ford. And Shelby had already worked out precisely how Ford could contribute. He had gone to the Pikes Peak Hill Climb on July 4th. Uh, and there he met Dave Evans. Evans explained to him that Ford was working on a new lightweight V8 that was actually scheduled for a Canadian pickup truck, a 221 cubic inch engine. Intrigued, Ford agreed to give the Texan an engine, the company's endorsement, and some working capital. Now all he needed was the lightweight chassis to put it in. Which was when he heard that the small British company, AC Cars, had just lost their supply of engines and had been reduced to manufacturing invalid carriages. AC Cars was uh, a small family-owned business owned by the Herlock family. A very old established company. It was um, born in, I believe, in 1904 and had a uh, pretty checkered history. The car that AC had been famous for, the Ace, was light and nimble but was no firebrand. With a Ford V8 under the hood, it might be a real contender. I called them. I set an appointment up, got on an airplane and went over there to meet them and had a very cordial meeting. They seemed interested. They were building invalid carriages and they had this Trujillo chassis that was 20 years old at the time, but we got along very, very well. ACs thought this was a good way of producing a sports car for, uh, which would sell quite well in America at a reasonable price. Shelby hoped that somehow, using a 20-year-old chassis, a roadster body and the engine from a pickup truck, he was about to build a Ferrari beating race car. We built the first car. Turner was their uh, engineer. And we adapted the, the V8 engine to it. When we drove it down the road there at Tim's Ditton, I knew that we had something that uh, there wasn't a production Ferrari or a production Corvette or Jaguar that would come close to it. When I saw the first chassis, I think it was the first time that I believed that maybe this was really going to happen. Not that I really ever doubted, I didn't have time to doubt, but that this was really the first tangible thing that meant that we were going to build at least one Cobra. For the man that was once king of Le Mans, this was the first step on the road to recovery. Back in the States, Shelby's hot rodders spared no time in souping up the engine even further. I can remember when we started that thing up, and uh, it, was a, it was a real race car for the street. There was no Ferrari for the street that had anything like that at the time. Uh, Ferrari always exaggerated their horsepower anyway. And uh, I knew that we, I knew we had something. What he had was a car that represented a remarkable marriage of continents a lightweight British chassis from the narrow country lanes of Europe, powered by an enormous V8 engine built for the five-lane highways of America. Luck and circumstance had collided. Shelby was onto one hell of a motor car. Well, I liked it. It just looked hot, you know. <laughs> the suits at Ford were ecstatic. They couldn't wait to get the car out in the track and start hammering the Corvettes. But first, Shelby had to comply with the basic rule of production car racing. Before you can enter a race, you have to manufacture at least 100 cars, which meant Shelby had to find 100 customers. We took it around to the magazines and we would repaint it about every two weeks, so it would seem that we had more than one car. We entered the New York Automobile Show. And uh, we were the focus uh, of uh, the Ford exhibit with this 
very bright yellow breasted cobra. Joan Cole and I were the only employees and we took turns 12 hours a day passing out the literature. Nobody knew what it was. And the excitement that was generated by the car, Shell and I pretty well knew that we really did have something. So we were off and running then. We ordered our first 100 cars. With 100 cars being built, Shelby needed larger premises. He found them in Santa Monica, where a race team had just got out of business. To add to the package, the race mechanic Phil Remington came with the building and immediately signed up to the Cobra project. But when he got under the skin of Shelby's car, he soon began to question the Cobra's race-winning potential. I didn't take Carol's dream very seriously at first because I knew what the competition was that we were facing, and I didn't feel our group of hot rodders and the American production engine had much of a chance. We were pretty impressed with the appearance of it, but actually when we got looking at the mechanical part, we began to have some second thoughts about its existence at all. Remington had a point. Building 100 cars for the road was one thing. Producing a race winner was a different matter altogether. But Ford was pushing to see the car in action, so a hastily prepared Cobra was entered for its first race in October 1962 at Riverside, California. Everybody came to the fence for that race because uh, it was a chance to see the new Corvette and the new Ford product, which was the Cobra, uh, compete head-to-head -head against the best California club racers at that time. Well, there was very little testing. The thing was under quite a time problem. We didn't have any time to really develop the car, so initially when we raced it, it was almost like the first test. Bob Bongerant was the number one driver for Corvette at the time. Nobody really believed that the Cobra was going to be that quick. Uh, they looked like they had pieced it together, and we all sort of looked it over in the pits and thought, well, it's pretty light. It might go pretty good, but yeah, it's never going to blow off a Corvette because Corvette was king then. Billy Krause was the, uh, was the driver for us at Riverside. As the Cobra team prepared to do battle, the drivers from the Corvette camp were unconcerned, and rightly so. This year's new Corvette Stingray promised to be faster than ever. As the starter's flag was raised, the crowd held its breath. And he just drove away from us. Shelby's little Cobra was showing the Corvettes the way home. When we actually saw it happening, I can remember that it was like a shot in the arm for all of the guys who worked on the racing crew. It was a sparkling debut, but racing is about endurance as well as speed, and before the end of the race, the 20-year-old chassis started to show its age. The upshot was that the, uh, the rear uh, stub axle on the Cobra sheared off we lost the wheel, and uh, the new Corvette ended up winning the race. This car was not really ready for an American V8 power and torque. The Cobra had shown huge potential, but failed to deliver a win. Before Shelby could be a true competitor, there was a mountain of work to be done. Anybody can go build a car that'll drive down the road, but then it has to be developed, and that's where the work comes in. Racing pushes a car to its limit. Running an engine flat out at maximum revs, thousands of gear changes, braking from 150 miles an hour, lap after lap after lap, constantly stressing components to braking point. And there's only one way to find those braking points, testing, until something snaps. Then you have to redesign it, build it stronger, and test some more. Key to this is having a test driver with enormous talent and stamina. Luckily, Carol Shelby knew just the guy. Coming up is Ken Miles, one of the best sport car drivers in America. Ken Miles was an ex-British tank commander who had got into racing after the war and had stumbled across Shelby. A fantastic 
British race driver, built his own uh, MG special that blew off all the factory Porsches. And uh, he's a great engineer, but a self-taught engineer. And he could take the car out and tell you exactly what's wrong with it. Pit stop of the 24-hour Enduro. Okay. He's happy. Yeah, we called him Teddy Teabag, side bite. Because he talked out of the side of his mouth. Okay. Teddy Teabag. <laughs> How appropriate. Except he's not really a teddy, is he? <laughs> he had a very dry... British wit, and people didn't understand him, and they thought he was a bit of an asshole, you know. But it was really his his personality, and once people got to know him, they realized that this man was a very funny person. He would go out and test for 500 miles, come in, all he'd do is sit down, he'd have his, his teapot right there, and he would light his fire and have him a cup of tea while he with his little finger up. The key to developing a great race car is having a test driver who understands exactly how the vehicle is behaving and can then explain it to the engineer. It was this partnership that got the Cobra into shape in record time. Obviously, Ken did that on purpose. Let's watch the way he always does it. Ken was a hell of a race driver and an innovator, and uh, a little caustic at times, but usually he was right, and uh, everyone respected him for his knowledge and capability. And between he and Phil Remington, they got the Cobras where they really handled well. Carroll put the entire responsibility of development of the car in Phil's hands, and it was his ability to do things very quickly that made us handle the problem. Literally in about 90 days, the car was completely re-engineered. The car that emerged was a far cry from the little British roadster that left Surrey. 350 brake horsepower from a 4.7 liter V8 engine in a vehicle weighing just over a ton, it was just what Shelby had set out to do. It could accelerate to 100 miles an hour and back to a standstill in under 14 seconds. When demonstrating the car to potential customers, Shelby would put a $100 bill on the dashboard, and if you could reach forward and grab it while he accelerated away, you could keep it. Nobody took home the hundred. Shelby and his motley crew of Southern Californian hot rodders had productionized a street legal race car and were going to take it to the tracks of America. The 1963 US Road Racing Championship was the first time this fully-fledged Cobra would be tested against the best machinery in America. Now Shelby would find out if he really was a contender. Our program was essentially to go out and win the United States Road Racing Championship. It was also Ford's chance to take the battle back to the Chevrolet Corvettes. And the news, good news. The Cobra was an underdog. Cobra, driven by Phil Hill, completed the first lap, leading the field. The 12-hour run began at 10 in the morning, and 12 hours later, the Cobra, driven by Ken Miles, got the checkered flag. The new Cobra, product of Phil Remington's workshop and Ken Miles' endless testing, proved a spectacular success. The Cobras campaigned all over the United States, uh, essentially unopposed. I mean, there were a lot of other hot cars out there, but really when the Cobras rolled in, it was all over. At Sebring in Florida, it broke all records for an American car, beating off competition from around the world. It was the start of an era. At Laguna Seca, first, second, and fourth. Watkins Glen, first, second, third, and fifth. Kent, Washington, first, second, and third. The drivers used to flip coins to see who was going to win the race. <laughs> 
10 miles, the sign to go for overall. It's pushing us 98 Cobra after third place Penske. And get by going through turn five. He was so far ahead at times that uh, he could come and make these silly pit stops just so that he could go out and have a little competition and race a little bit. And he'd say, can you check the fan belts? So fan belts, can we? He's talking check the fan belts. The engine's running. How can I check the... Just check the fan belts. He used to... <laughs> or he would come in for a glass of water. Yeah, I believe I'll have a, a spot of water, old chap. Sometimes a Coke. I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was so funny. Even before the Mid-Ohio Classic at Mansfield, the Cobras had won the coveted U.S. Manufacturers Road Racing Club trophy. We were just winning everything. And it was pretty amazing for a company that hadn't even been in business for a year to all of a sudden be at the top of the heap. Miles is in front to stay and takes the checkered flag. Of the Cobra's success in America was a shot in the arm for Ford's domestic sales. The win on Sunday, sell on Monday effect had turned the tables on Chevrolet. The suits at Ford started to look at how they might repeat this success in Europe which was when they heard an amazing piece of news. Ferrari was up for sale. That's a long story. I probed my memory. Enzo Ferrari was a great guy, and Henry Ford used to meet him in Europe, and he kept seeing all those red racing cars and knocking everybody's brains <laughs> and said, what are they? He said, well, that's Ferrari's company in Modena, Italy. By acquiring Ferrari, Ford would be able to shortcut the development process Shelby and his hot rodders had been through and gain instant credibility in Europe. Best of all, they might just win the biggest prize in the world at their first attempt, Le Mans. See, if you took one single race at the time, Le Mans was it. And, Le Mans, and Ford wanted to win Le Mans, so the best way to do that, probably the easiest way to do that, would be to buy Ferrari. Well, I think Ferrari was going through pretty hard times. And I don't know if at that stage he wanted to sell to Fiat. And um, he probably thought that um, it was a pretty good deal to sell to Ford. If Ferrari was having a tough time of it financially, it wasn't showing on the track. Their latest creation, the staggeringly beautiful GTO, was cleaning up. It took the first three places at the 1962 Le Mans. Three decades of legendary racing achievement and the image that went with it. The prancing horse and the famous blood red cars was all up for grabs. That's how far we had come. We decided we would race and win and then the old story, if you, if you couldn't uh, beat them, maybe you should try to buy them. <laughs> Ford were deadly serious and sent over a team of accountants to tie it all up. But they hadn't counted on having to deal with a man like Enzo Ferrari. Rumour has it, which I personally believe, that Ferrari never intended to sell at all and was simply negotiating in order to get money out of the Italian government or out of Fiat or something like that. But at the last moment, Ferrari turned Ford down. So Ford got mad and said, I'll have revenge and we'll beat you in the GT and we'll beat you in the prototypes. Ford wanted to hit Ferrari where it would hurt. The racetrack. Shelby decided now was the time to return to Europe and test the Cobra against Ferrari at Le Mans. It was a challenge that Shelby would relish for more than just sporting reasons. <laughs> there was not uh, good feelings between Ferrari and Shelby at all, and uh, he made no secret about that. But it was in that... Uh, I don't want to call it vengeance, um, but I, perhaps it was. I mean, not being a man, I don't quite know how you all function. <laughs> but I think that there, yes, there, that was at the bottom of the battle between the two of them was a personal thing between Shelby and Anzo Ferrari. It went way back into Shelby's early racing career, and um, it was very personal. When racing with Aston Martin in the 50s, Shelby had needed to base himself where he could travel easily to the tracks of Europe. 
The town he had chosen was Modena, the heart of European race car engineering and the home of its master, Enzo Ferrari. I met Enzo Ferrari for the first time in 1955. And uh, that summer, I spent the whole summer with, uh, with his son, Dino. I met Ferrari nearly on a daily basis. Uh, they seemed to develop, um, uh, I won't say it was a hate, but uh, he was aiming at Ferrari the whole time, which was a jolly good thing. I never did like the way he treated his drivers because he, uh, although I respected Ferrari, he uh, tweaked them up. And uh, for instance, Musso and Castellotti were very dear friends. And uh, after they'd both driven Ferrari within a year, they weren't speaking to each other. Ferrari would say uh, to Musso, why is Castellotti saying bad things about you? Uh, uh, I thought you all were friends, and then he'd go to Castellotti and do the same thing. But he did that uh, all his life. That was his way of getting the maximum out of the drivers. He didn't have much regard, in my opinion, for drivers. He, he always thought that the car that he produced was the best car in the world, and uh, um, his drivers should be thankful for the drive. And I think you'll find that that's what happened with... Uh, with a lot of the star drivers, including Fangio. The uh, uh, Ferrari and Fangio didn't get along that well. It was his attitude. In June 1963, a month after the negotiations with Ford had fallen through, Shelby sent two Cobras to Le Mans. The thug would get its chance to bloody the nose of the thoroughbred. But deep down, Shelby knew that despite their success in the US, the Cobras were not designed for winning in Europe. Historically, European racing had always been on public roads with long open sections. A successful car needed a mix of reliability and a very high top speed. Le Mans and the Ferraris epitomized this style of racing. By contrast, the America that had been the Cobra's patch was all about oval tracks with short straights, often in disused airfields. Top speeds were much lower, and winning was more about brute force and big tires. In the time available, all Shelby's team could do to try and make the Cobra's competitive was to bolt a couple of hard tops onto the roadsters in an attempt to make the cars more aerodynamic and therefore faster. It was a long shot, but they had to try. The race began. Ford and Shelby held their breath, but not for long. In 63, uh, when we took the Roadsters with coop tops on them over there, we were absolutely killed in terms of aerodynamics because the cars just did not have the top speed. It was like trying to shove a brick through the air, so consequently they weren't very fast or reliable. I recall both cars failed with engine problems. Oh, in the short courses, the Cobras would blow anything off in the production class in 63. But then when you got to Le Mans, the aerodynamics would, uh, would be in your way, where the GTOs and so forth were very aerodynamic. We didn't have that. The killer stretch that destroyed the Cobras was the infamous Mulsan Strait. And over three miles long, it allowed the Ferraris to reach 180 miles an hour, their sleek bodywork slipping through the air. By contrast, the Cobra could only reach 160. Their ancient bodywork was simply not shaped for high speed. Carroll knew that he wanted to go back to Europe and win, especially against Ferrari. Shelby realized that if he was going to win, he would need a more aerodynamic car. The concept of going to Europe and having cars that would go almost 200 miles an hour was beyond what anybody in the United States really thought about. The opinion in, in the shop of the rest of the people was, how are we going to go to Europe? And that's when uh, Pete Brock and I sat down and decided to uh, see if we could uh, build us a coupe. The coupe was to be a roadster chassis with a new aerodynamic body. 
but this time, the crew of hot rodders from California wouldn't be able to buy it off the shelf. They would have to design it themselves. And who would be chief designer? Shall we turn to his 23-year-old employee, Pete Brock? So we started by taking the chassis that had been crashed at Daytona earlier that year by Skip Hudson and pulling the body right off the chassis. He had never built a car before like that. He drew out on the floor the shape, and we all looked at it and went, yeah, right, Pete. And uh, he said, no, it'll work. When I showed it to other people in the shop, they were absolutely aghast because it was the strangest, ugliest looking car that anybody had ever seen. The Ferrari GTO being the prettiest and most beautiful car that had ever been produced. I didn't think it had much hope because the chassis was still very unsophisticated compared to some of the European cars in particular. There was no suitable windscreen out there, so Ken sat down. We looked at his height in the car, held the steering wheel in his hand about where it was going to be, and literally with duct tape and a couple of pieces of wood, outlined where the windscreen was going to be. And the first thing that we designed was the windscreen. We designed the car around what the windscreen was going to look like. It was amazing to see it all come together. And then they started uh, molding the aluminum fenders to it and the body to it. And I saw it grow pretty much daily. And all of a sudden, there it was. The body was all together. In three months, Pete Brock and the racing crew had designed and built a new Le Mans car from scratch. I thought that the coupe looked funny, but um, since no one asked me, <laughs> I did not offer any, any of my own opinion on it. The uh, coupe project was uh, fraught with controversy from the very beginning because the, uh, the whole concept was so foreign to anything that had been seen in the United States. It didn't look like anything that had been successful before. Though Pete had confidence in the new shape, Shelby wasn't so sure. We didn't understand the aerodynamics of it too well. We called Benny Howard in, who was a great aerodynamicist, executive, ex-executive vice president at uh, Convair Aviation. And Carol brought him down to the shop to show him what we were doing. And uh, Benny looked at the car and uh, just right off the wall said the thing is never going to work. He told us if we'd extend the tail out about three feet to a point, that we'd be much better off aerodynamically. But that would have uh, really ruined the looks of the car. Carol and Benny went to lunch. He came back and he said, what do you think? And I said, I still think I'm right. And he said, well, you better be. With Pete Brock's reputation on the line, the team took the finished car to the local track for a trial run. First time we tested it at Riverside, the car lifted completely off the ground 160 miles an hour. Then we had to start fooling with air dams. I wondered if we would ever get it right after about the first two weeks of testing, but then Ken and John Collins riding with him for a thousand miles, probably with no seat in the right side, are the ones that uh, that made it work. I had to sit on the floor. There was no no seat, no seat belts, and I was hanging on the with my foot up under the dashboard and trying to hang on to the roll bar. And as we we're going into turn six, he said, "Look out the window." He said, "You see the back wheel off the ground." <laughs> Lap by lap, they ironed out the problems and produced a car that was not only aerodynamically sound, it was fast. Damn fast. I remember going down the, the long back straight and I was wondering when he was going to put the brakes on. I could see the wall in front of me. <laughs> and I thought, he's never going to stop. And of course, he's put the brakes on and we got around and pulled into the pits and we've been clocked at 183 mile an hour, I think it was. Ken said it can't run that fast. So 
he asked us what rear axle ratio we had in. We told him what it was. And he said, well, take it back to the shop is it, and check it out. So we, we told him, we checked it out. He said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. He says, pull the diff out and check it out. So we pulled the diff out, and he counted the teeth, and of course it was that axle ratio, and that's what the car was doing, 183 mile an hour. <laughs> so when Ken Miles came back from that test and called Carol and told him how fast that we had gone, uh, that pretty much changed the opinion in the shop. 183 miles an hour was proper Ferrari beating pace. Despite the doubts, Brock and the boys had done it. Everyone was so excited, they figured now finally we can go out and win, uh, beat the Ferraris fair and square. Unbelievable. It was everything that, and more, <laughs> that Shelby had expected the car to perform. Everything and more. And we knew then that we were not afraid. Shelby American's Daytona Coupe was the beast to the GTO's beauty. It had all the brute force of the Cobra Roadster, sheathed in a streamlined, lightweight aluminium body, bristling with vents to allow the monstrous V8 to keep cool. The Daytona was another, another animal altogether. That was a completely different motor car. It felt quite different. It handled very well. It was able to hold its own against uh, GTOs. And in my view, it was a little bit faster in a straight line as well. The deadline was looming. With three months to Le Mans, once again, Shelby would have to prove himself and his car on the racetrack. First up, February 1964, Daytona Speedway, and the Ferraris were out in force. And the race is on. The car was so quick, Ferrari were just absolutely rocking in their boots. I mean, they could see there was absolutely no way they could come close to us. When the race started, it just we just ran away from them. I mean, it was, uh, I think at one point we were 38 minutes ahead of them. You know, we're starting to count in minutes, not seconds, you know, which is incredible. After a disastrous pit stop, the race was over for the coupe. Though the car had been quick, it had not been reliable. And as they say in racing, in order to finish first, first you have to finish. The second race of the season at Sebring, Florida, would be the coupe's last chance to prove itself if Ford were to back the car for Le Mans. Since 1950, sterling specimens of engineering have been exhibiting speed and stamina on this course at Sebring. We rebuilt the car after Daytona got it ready for Sebring, fixed the problem with the overheating, we put a different uh, pump on the rear axle. And then we thought, well, we can win Sebring with the car, there's no doubt about that. Five, four, three, two, one, two. The Coupe ran the 12-hour race in spectacular style. Not only was it incredibly quick, this time it also proved reliable. They came into their own, I think, at, uh, at Sebring. And they'd improved the car a lot by then. I think they'd got rack and pinion steering, and uh, they'd really developed it nicely. Keep the Ferraris driving hard. The sun is hot, the track is hot, the pace is hot. Once again, up against the Ferraris, this time the coupe was able to demonstrate its spectacular speed without breakdown. Shelby's new car went on to take the checkered flag. Although the 12 hours of Sebring was a much lesser race than Le Mans, winning it was a real boost for Shelby and the team. I really felt the Ferrari knew at Daytona that they were down with the GTOs because they were so slow compared to the Daytona Coupe, it was incredible. And at Sebring, we waxed them as well so easily that uh, well, there was, no, was just no competition. We dominated. That's when we decided to go to Europe, when we saw that we could beat the GTO in a 12-hour race. Carol knew we were going to Europe because he had the intention and knew we were going to go to Europe. But until the car ran at Sebring and we won the GT class down there, that was when we finally got approval from Ford Motor Company.
The following month, Shelby and his crew headed for the tracks of Europe with a new Daytona coupe and a brace of roadsters. And here's the singer. Is this the kind of a team that can win at Le Mans? I think this is a team that's going to win at Le Mans. Well, congratulations and continued good luck to you. This time, he was prepared. Shelby knew that the tough European road circuits would be punishing on the cars. There was so much repair work that had to be done after these strenuous events, and without a complete workshop and a good capable crew to do it, it was impossible to maintain a car. By using the roadsters as mobile test beds, he'd be able to find the limits and weaknesses of the components they shared with the Daytona. The coupes would be saved for the big one, Le Mans. It was a constant series of modifications to them, improving the brakes, improving uh, the suspension, uh, getting the right sway bars, uh, uh, just 10,000 things that you have to do when you're trying to take a mule and outrun a racehorse. By the summer of 64, the coupe was ready to take on the best in the world. A car conceived and built in a few short months was about to represent the name, not just of Carroll Shelby, but of Ford America. At last, the big event arrived. Le Mans, 1964. Carroll Shelby and his mule versus the rest of the world. And in particular, Ferrari with his thoroughbreds. With 30 minutes to go, the countdown starts. The team was to be made of Cobra veterans Dan Gurney and Bob Bongerant. Shelby's last five years of blood, sweat and tears were all for the next 24 hours. At 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, all would be decided. Five minutes to go and 55 drivers moved to their marks. Whether Shelby and his team of Californian hot rodders had definitively mastered the art of building a race car was about to be put to the ultimate test. So, now start the race, did a great Le Mans start. Into the S's for the first time. It's the Ferraris of Rodriguez, Graham Hill, David Piper and Mike Sammons Aston. Near Park leads the Cobras for the Sears. The Ferraris took off into the lead, making it to the crucial first corner in front. But by two hours into the race, the Daytona Coupe, with its incredible top speed, had reeled them in and overtaken them. Took off and uh, leading our class, and we're ahead of the Ferraris. And then it's my turn. I, I get in, take off, go out. Now there's several hundred thousand spectators here to watch the race. And you see spectators almost the entire route around the track. There's a few forest areas you don't see them in. And it just gave you such a neat, warm feeling. This time, the straight that had killed the Cobra in 63 posed no problems for the coup. I'd never driven that fast before. I'm down, going down the Molson Strait in our number five Cobra Daytona Coupe. We ran 196 miles an hour. Lap after lap after lap. With the high speeds taking their toll on their pursuing arch rivals, by the early evening, the coupes were stretching their lead. The damaged cylinder had joint. Once again, an early pacemaker had no more to show for it than a temporary lap record at 131 miles an hour. You never, ever get overconfident Le Mans because it's 24 hours and anything can happen. You're still dealing with metal fatigue. You go into the race with a plan and uh, you hope it works. Strategy is everything at Le Mans. Every car has two drivers, so teamwork is an essential part of the process. Bongerant and Gurney took on board the words of their team manager. When John Wire gave us a lap time we needed to run by, which felt totally slow. Said, that's the way you're gonna win. If you guys go out and run hard at the beginning, you're gonna wear the car out, and you're gonna break something, and you won't finish. But now the big cars are due in on schedule. Bob and I made a very strong combination, and uh, I think we both realized it, and we both uh, focused on the job at hand. At 
As the sky darkened, the coupe number five was still ahead of the remaining two Ferraris. But as the sun came up, disaster struck. Uh, with five hours to go, I think it was, the, uh, the oil cooler broke and we couldn't replace it. We didn't have the pieces. So we came in for a pit stop and bypassed the oil cooler, which enabled us to ru keep running, but we had to do it at a reduced pace. We ran the last five hours with an oil temperature over 300 degrees. At 300 degrees, engine oil is close to vaporizing. That is, if it doesn't burn through the high-pressure hoses first. When the Cobra rejoined the race, the Ferraris were on the same lap, right behind it. And Bondurant knew if he didn't take it easy, he'd blow the engine. Amongst the grand touring cars, Battle Royal, with number 24, the Berlitz Bianchi GT Ferrari, trying desperately to catch Gurney's Cobra, leading the category. The last few laps of the coupe's final stint seemed to take an age. But when Bongerant rounded the last corner, he met a sight he'd never seen before. No one told me about the finish. Uh, and what happens at the finish, you go across the finish line very slowly. You're just cruising over there like third year. I came out, fourth year, flat out, and all of a sudden, the crowd started coming over the wall. And I go, my God, what are all these people doing here in the middle of the track? So on the binders, kneeling to a down, shooting and slowing down. Yeah, we got the checker flag and we won. I mean, it was such a neat feeling. The car that Carroll built had made it to the end of the hardest 24 hours in motor racing and finished in front. Our job was, was relatively easy at Le Mans, and uh, we were very proud of it. Enzo was livid. He never dreamed that he would be defeated at Le Mans. He thought that was his stomping grounds. The unbelievable had happened. A chicken farmer from Texas had masterminded the design, development, and build of a world-class racing car. Prepared and raced by a bunch of Southern Californian hot rodders it had taken on the might and power of the world champions, Ferrari, and won. It was a battle that marked the end of an era. From the mid-60s onwards, racing cars became a whole different deal. Never again would a truckload of determination be enough to get you to the track, let alone win. Le Mans was to become the domain of highly organized factory teams and their global sponsors. The nature of the art form Shelby had mastered was to change for good, which made the era of the Cobra Ferrari Wars for Shelby and his crew a period in time that they would relish forever. I think that there was not a guy that was uh, affiliated with the Cobra project that today does not look back and say, it was the best of times. Stay with us here on BBC Four. We've the somewhat more sedate hobby of canal walking coming up next with Julia Bradbury. <laughs>